welcome in this video i'm going to discuss about microsporogenesis and then later i shall even discuss the structure of uh, the pollen grain right so in the last session i think we understood the structure of the anther right and inside this anther we have seen there are four microsporangia so here this is one microsporangium this is another and of course total we have is uh, four microsporangia and i told that inside this microsporangia so there is a tissue called sporogenous tissue it's called sporogenous tissue and this sporogenous tissue is uh, the one that undergoes meiosis and finally results in the formation of microspores and that process what we call a microsporogenesis so now how to define this microsporogenesis so it is simply the formation of microspores from pollen mother cells right is called microsporogenesis the formation of microspores so here the microspores are nothing but pollen grains the formation of microspores from pollen mother cells is called microsporogenesis so here as i mentioned the microspores are the one uh, right which we call uh, them also as the pollen grains now each cell of this sporogenous tissue is capable of uh, forming into a microspore tetrad so this sporogenous tissue undergoes meiosis and results in the formation of something called microspore tetrad so it means that there will be four microspores right that's the reason why i have used this word microspore tetrad so four microspores here yeah, tetrad which means four so four microspores which means four pollen grains will be present right so this sporogenous tissue right is capable of giving rise to the microspore tetrad so hence uh, each cell in this porogenous tissue is a potential pollen so i call it the potential pollen because it is uh, it is capable of giving rise to the pollen grains so hence the cells of this sporogenous tissue i call it as the potential pollen or also i can call them as the microspore mother cells or i can also use another word pollen mother cells so in short for this i use pmc which stands for pollen mother cells so the potential pollen or the microspore mother cell or the pollen mother cell are one and the same and these are what we call meiocytes right so we know that meiocytes will be deployed in condition so all these cells are deployed so all these cells are deployed so whatever of course all these are one and the same the potential pollen the microspore mother cell or the pollen mother cells are one and the same and these will be undergoing the meiosis and results in the formation of a micro spore tetrad it results in the formation of microspore tetrad so let's see here this is the potential pollen right and this one undergoes the process of uh, right meiosis and it results in the formation of uh, right so four microspores so you can see in this case so there are 
uh, four microspores present here. So this is a microspore pattern. Is the microspore pattern. So now each microspore. So of course these are four microspores, and each microspore in this tetrad is haploid. So I can say this is haploid. So here uh, each microspore inside this tetrad is going to become the pollen grain, right? And of course this is haploid. This is also another haploid cell, haploid, and this is also haploid. So I hope uh, we remember the process of meiosis. So in case of meiosis, the cell, the mother cell will undergo uh, the process uh, that is the meiosis and finally results in the formation of uh, four daughter cells. So here also you can see totally uh, four uh, daughter cells are produced which I am calling them as microspores and these four microspores are present together that's why I use the word the microspore tetrad. Right. So the mitospore mother cells or the pollen mother cells have undergone meiosis and finally results in the formation of four uh, microspores which are present together and called microspore tetrad. Right. Now this uh, each as I told each microspore now of course uh, as the anther matures right what happens is these uh, microspores which are all present together of course there will be several thousand of uh, uh, pollen grains will be developed in each of these microsporangia and now these uh, four microspores in each tetrad they are going to get separated and finally uh, result in formation of four pollen grains see i am talking about only one microspore mother cell so one microspore mother cell have finally given rise to four pollen grains so like this there are several thousands of these porogenous cells present inside each microsporangium and each one of it is uh, a potential pollen and will result in the formation of uh, the four pollen grains so the pollen grains will be produced in huge numbers and by the time the anther matures okay the pollen grains are ready now they are formed and here we know this is the line of dehiscence and what happens is so this one breaks open right and now there are a lot many uh, pollen grains present inside so all these are the pollen grains present inside and those pollen grains will be uh, released out once the uh, anther matures of course by the time the pollen grains uh, readily form inside this uh, each microsporangium and they will be released once the dehiscence uh, takes place right so i hope this is clear so that's uh, all about this microsporogenesis so the formation of the pollen grains so now let's look at the structure of pollen grains right so we know that the pollen grain is nothing but the male gametophyte so the pollen grain is the male gametophyte and uh, if we have seen in case of a hibiscus plant so the, in the hibiscus plant once these anthers uh, mature and they days and release uh, yellowish uh, powdery uh, substance so actually that yellowish uh, powdery substance is nothing but the pollen that is released from the anthers and when we see these uh, pollen grains in different species their architecture will be uh, different so uh, in uh, different species so there will be size uh, shape right the design the colors uh, will be different from species to species in fact by looking at uh, looking at its architecture one can come to know that from which species uh, this pollen uh, has come from so right so here 
the pollen grains have various sizes so smaller some are little bigger okay so they have various sizes and then they have uh, various shapes they have uh, colors right and even we find the designs on those pollen grains right so if you see in some cases you may find a spiny like uh, okay appearance on these pollen grains and okay so they may be having so you can see here the design uh, is changed so different species will have different designs the size the shape the colors right and so on and as uh, told you that by looking at these uh, sizes shapes colors one can identify uh, from which species these pollen grains have uh, come from now let's uh, see a generalized structure of the pollen grain so here the pollen grains are generally uh, spherical in shape so when we see the shape so these are generally spherical right so of course uh, not in all cases they are spherical in some cases they will be triangular in some cases they will be okay uh, oval shape so in some the pollen grains will be oval in some the pollen grains uh, will be seen okay triangular so you can see in this case they are a triangular so it may change but i'm talking a gen about the generalized uh, structure of the pollen grain so that's why i have mentioned so they are generally uh, spherical so in most of the cases you will find the pollen grains are spherical in shape and then coming to the size so the size is around 25 to 50 micrometer in diameter so the size of these pollen grains will range from 25 to 50 micrometers in diameter and these pollen grains are actually covered by two layered uh, wall so we find a two layer wall of the pollen grain okay right so there is a two layered wall so outer layer is exine so the outer layer is okay so this is exine this is the outer layer and there will be an inner layer and that inner layer is in time so you find uh, each pollen grain is covered by two layers so the outer layer is exine and the inner layer is in time right so here the exine in this case it's made up of uh, A substance called sporo pollen so it is made up of a substance called sporo pollen whereas in time so this in time is thin and it is uh, continuous whereas this outer layer is not continuous you can see uh, there is a absence of sporo pollen at some points and these are the locations what I call them as germ pores right of course these germ pores right are the one which uh, help in so help in okay the uh, uh, you know uh, production of that pollen tube so the pollen tube actually comes out through this uh, right the germ pores during the process of uh, germination so here So I'll just mention that the pollen tube comes out through these germ pores during germination on stigma. 
So during germination on stigma, right, the germ ports will help in the production of uh, uh, right the pollen tube. So this is uh, so how you will see this is the germ ports. Okay, and you can see here the pollen tube coming out. So this is the pollen tube which will carry those male gametes, right? So which I will discuss uh, this one uh, in our later sessions, okay? Right, so exon, uh, which is not continuous, at some locations you will not find the presence of this spore of pollen and uh, those locations are called germ pores. Whereas this in time, it is thin and continuous and this one is made up of uh, two substances uh, one it is cellulose and another one it is pectin so it's made up of cellulose and pectin whereas the exine it is made up of a substance called sporopollenin so this sporopollenin is the most resistant organic material so this is the most resistant organic material so there is no enzyme to right digest this spore of pollen so no enzyme to digest spore of pollen right so as this is uh, as i told that the spore of pollen is most uh, resistant organic material and there is no enzyme to uh, digest this spore pollenin and also uh, this is able to withstand so here in fact the pollen grains are able to withstand high temperature strong acids because of uh, the presence of this spore pollenin so this spore pollenin can withstand high temperatures so it can withstand high temperatures right and uh, strong acids and also alkali chemicals so when uh, these alkali chemicals or strong acids or high temperatures are applied even then the sporal pollenin is not going to get uh, destroyed and because of this, uh, that is due to presence of this poropollenin. So due to presence of uh, sporopollenin, the pollen grains are preserved as fossils. So they are preserved as fossils. So fossils are uh, the dead remains of uh, organisms. So when the pollen grain is released, of course the pollen grains are live, right? And after some time they lose their viability and they fall. Of course, all pollen grains will not be, uh, you know, transferred to the stigma. So they will not uh, get onto the stigma of uh, another flower. And most of them, they may fall on the ground and they lose the viability so they will become dead and even then so what happens this in time and the inner structures they all get okay decomposed but this exine will remain intact so it is not going to get destroyed and that will be remaining for several thousands and thousands of uh, year that's why i said that due to presence of that spore of pollen in, in the exine uh, that is the outer layer the pollen grains are very much uh, are well preserved as these uh, fossils right so uh, we have seen that the pollen grain so which is covered by an outer exine is made up of spore of pollen and uh, in time that is uh, thin and continuous and made up of uh, uh, cellulose and pectin and below that you will find the cell membrane or the plasma membrane Okay, so this is the cell membrane and you will find here one large cell and one small 
cell. Right. So you will find one large cell and one small cell. So this small cell is called generative cell. It's called generative cell. And this one, the large cell is called the vegetative cell. So you will find right two cells. So this is the vegetative cell, right? So two cells, one is a generative cell and one is a vegetative cell. Right, see, uh, I told you that from the sporogenous uh, tissue or the pollen mother cell, we have actually obtained uh, a microspore uh, tetrad. So we have seen Right, so this is the microspore tetra. And now what happened is one cell, I'm discussing about only one cell. Of course, the fate of the remaining three cells will be the same. So hence, I just uh, take only one cell, right? So this one, it starts, you know, of course, this is the nucleus and it starts developing vacuoles inside. It starts developing the vacuole. So here, the vacuoles and uh, Later, it results in the formation of a, a asymmetrical spindle. So it results in the formation of asymmetrical spindle. So here is so here the spindle is so this is the spindle that you will see in case of the uh, cell. And when this uh, spindle is positioned asymmetrical right inside the dividing uh, cell so what happens it results in unequal division of that parent cell uh, right and results in the formation of two unequal daughter cells so this is asymmetrical asymmetrical spindle so asymmetrical spindle so which means it is not symmetrical so because of the if it is a symmetrical spindle then the parent cell will divide into two equal daughter cells but this one will finally uh, result in so due to the positioning of the spindle asymmetrically we see that this cell is going to divide into in fact uh, two cells one there will be a larger cell and one there is a smaller cell so that larger cell is what i call here the vegetative cell and that smaller cell which i call it the generative uh, cell right so of course this is the vegetative cell and this one is the generative cell so just i have mentioned uh, the vc here which means vegetative cell and GC which is uh, the generative cell so same thing which I have mentioned over here so this is the fate with uh, the remaining three cells also even though I have uh, drawn only for uh, one cell the fate with the remaining three will be also the same right and finally we see here that each pollen grain uh, which is uh, you know is going to be released from the anther will be having a one larger or bigger cell called the vegetative cell and one smaller uh, cell right called the generative cell right so next uh, here this vegetative cell as i told it's a bigger cell when compared with the generative cell and uh, okay it has a abundant food reserve so this generative cell is big and has abundant food reserve so here abundant which means large quantities so large quantities of uh, food material is present so abundant food reserve is nothing but large quantity of food materials are present in its cytoplasm so large quantities of food materials are present in its uh, 
uh, cytoplasm that is in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell. So this vegetative cell is bigger when compared with the generative cell and uh, it has abundant uh, food, reserve food, okay. And then, right, it has irregular nucleus. So the, uh, the shape of this nucleus, so you can see here, I have not drawn a uh, spherical. So uh, the shape of the uh, nucleus of this vegetative cell is irregular. And now suspended in the cytoplasm of this vegetative cell is uh, a spindle shaped cell called the generative cell. I just mentioned it here. So the generative cell, it is spindle shaped and it has a dense cytoplasm and it is suspended in the cytoplasm of uh, in the cytoplasm of vegetative cell right and this is smaller in size of course when compared with a vegetative cell so this is the smaller spindle shaped cell which is present uh, suspended in the cytoplasm of the vegetative cell so the remaining all so you can see this is the vegetative cell right so this generative cell uh, it is uh, small and it will be suspended in fact it is suspended in the cytoplasm of the you know what i say the vegetative cell and of course so there is a nucleus it has nucleus right so i hope that that part is clear now in 60 percent of uh, angiosperms 60 percent of angiosperms these pollen grains are released at two cell stage so they are released at a two cell stage so the two cells right are one the generative cell and another one is the vegetative cell so here in 60 percent of angiosperms the pollen grains are released at a two cell stage so what are that two cells the two cells are nothing but the vegetative cell plus the generative cell Right. The remaining 40% uh, of angiospermic plants, so in the remaining angiospermic plants, what we see is that the pollen grains are released at, so I say in remaining 40% of angiospermic uh, plants, the pollen grains are released at three cell stage so are released at three cell stage so the question comes that uh, what are these three cells in fact in this three cell stage so one cell it is vegetative cell that remains plus what happens is the generative cell is going to divide mitotically and result in the formation of uh, two male gametes. So hence one vegetative cell and two male gametes. So that together it will form the three cells, right? So in the remaining 40% of angiospermic plants, the pollen grains will be released at three cell stage and the three cells in that pollen grains are one vegetative cell and two male gametes. So I'll just mention here that these two male gametes from where they have come from, right? So this generative cell will undergo mitosis and results in the formation of uh, two male gametes. Results in the two male gametes. Of course, uh, in this case, at the time 
when the pollen grain is released in case of this 60 percent angiospermic plants so even though it is released at uh, in fact two cell stage later the generative cell will divide to form the male gametes right so this of course uh, the three cell stage where i have mentioned that at the time of release the generative cell will divide and become the male gametes in case of this two cell stage at the time of release it will be having the generative cell intact but later after its release the generative cell will undergo mitosis and produces the male gamete so what i say is that the generative cell will develop the male gametes so right So that's what I mentioned that the generative cell develops male gametes. So it is going to develop the male gametes, whereas the vegetative cell, the vegetative cell is going to develop pollen tube. Is going to develop the pollen tube, right? okay so that's about the pollen grain fine see i hope you understood this at the three cell stage and two cell stage but whatever the fate of the generative cell is that it is going to form the male gametes so right before it is released it may divide and form the male gametes then it will become three cell stage after its release the generative cell may undergo mitosis and produce uh, okay male gametes so then the condition will become a two cell stage right so i hope this part is clear so the next one let's see that these pollen grains so the pollen grains of uh, some plants are going to cause uh, severe allergies and bronchial affliction right so pollen grains right can cause right uh, severe allergies and bronchial afflictions so we can see, of course, uh, there will be some trouble with the lungs. It's called bronchial uh, afflictions, which uh, are going to lead to chronic respiratory disorder. So they lead to chronic respiratory disorders. So these uh, chronic respiratory disorders, chronic means uh, which will develop in long term. So the person have to expose to the pollen grains for a long term, not just uh, uh, one or two times. So a person is getting exposed to these pollen grains for a long time, then the person may develop these uh, okay allergies or the bronchial affliction. So the bronchial afflictions, uh, so which uh, all will come under this chronic respiratory disorders like uh, asthma, and then okay. So uh, the person will develop this asthma in, in, in fact, continuously getting exposed to uh, this chronic, I mean, exposed to these pollen grains and can also uh, lead to bronchitis. So here bronchitis, which means uh, inflammation of bronchi, inflammation of bronchi, both are uh, what I say are chronic respiratory disorders. So because the person have inhaled the pollen grains for a very long time. So that's the reason why I have mentioned the, the chronic. Okay. And that inhalation may result in the deposition of the pollen grains inside the lungs uh, leading to the respiratory uh, disorders. Now, so the pollen grains of some plants uh, is the one that going to cause this uh, allergies. Like we see in case of a plant called Bardinium 
hysterophorus so a plant named Pardinium hysterophorus this is commonly called the carrot grass plant and this was uh, introduced into India. In fact, it came into it came into India along with the imported wheat. So it means that when we were importing the wheat from some other countries, right? And along with that, this uh, you know the carrot grass entered into our country and it started to uh, spread. So in fact, this Panthenium hysterophorus is of no use, right? So we are not using this plant for any purposes. So hence it is a weed plant and it started to grow uh, everywhere in every places uh, in the country and it releases the pollen grains uh, which when inhaled by human beings can cause these asthma and uh, uh, bronchitis problems, right? So now not all of uh, of those uh, pollen grains, uh, you know, have this uh, issue. So some of these pollen, some of the pollen grains from some species we are using as food supplements. So it means that, so the pollen grains, the pollen grains are also used as food supplements, not of course of uh, of this uh, what I discussed Parthenium hysterophorus there are some other plant species uh, from which we get the pollen grains and these pollen, pollen grains okay are used as food supplements it means that we can eat them right and uh, in case of uh, you know in western countries already uh, it became uh, very much a trend that most of the people like to uh, use these uh, pollen grains uh, which are available uh, in the form of uh, tablets okay pollen tablets or pollen syrups so they make from this uh, the pollen tablets or syrups are available in the market so in western countries they use this okay pollen grains which are available in the form of tablets and syrups to increase their uh, performances or uh, stamina and already it is proved that taking these uh, pollen grains will result in increase in the performance of so it increases the performance of right athletes and race horses so their stamina okay and their strength uh, in fact increases uh, on consumption of these pollen grains right so with this we understand that uh, for humans the pollen grains can be advantageous or uh, disadvantageous so in some cases it's causing the pollen allergies and in some okay so we uh, use those pollen grains to enhance uh, our uh, performance or stamina strength and so now uh, these pollen grains when they are released so at uh, within what time they should reach the stigma uh, of a, a flower so whether these pollen grains once they are released are they going to stay uh, in live condition so what i call it viable so viability of the pollen grains so now let's look at the pollen viability means how long the pollen grains are going to be in live condition so once these pollen grains are released right they must be in the what i say the live condition uh, before they reach the stigma so if they die then even though they fall on the stigma of another flower they will be of no use right so that's what we call it the pollen viability now when we see in case of uh, cereals like uh, uh, rice and in case of uh, wheat etc in these plants the pollen grains will remain viable right uh, up to 30 minutes so in this case the pollen grains are 
viable up to 30 minutes so they are viable up to uh, 30 minutes right so it means that they will be in the live condition for a period of 30 minutes so within this period they should reach the stigma of uh, another flower now in case of uh, some other uh, you know uh, plants belonging to the families like uh, rosaceae then leguminosae right and uh, solanaceae in these families right the pollen grains remain viable for months means they're not going to die so they will be in live condition uh, for months so uh, in those times even though they reach the after months also if they reach the stigma of another flower they will be able to germinate and then produce the pollen tube and will be able to carry that male gametes to the uh, female uh, gametophyte so which i'm going to discuss those parts in coming uh, sessions right so here uh, this which i told the pollen viability in some plants it will be uh, it means that uh, see uh, which i told uh, that the viability of the pollen varies uh, from species to species right so in this uh, cells like rice and wheat it will be uh, in live condition only up to 30 minutes whereas in the members of this uh, rosaceae, leguminous and solanaceae, you will find the pollen grains uh, are in live condition or viable for uh, a long time. So that is for months. Right. So now uh, the pollen which uh, has a very less viability. So you can see in this case, the pollen grains viability is very less. So is there any uh, chance of increasing their viability? Of course, in the naturally we cannot do it but artificially we can store these uh, pollen grains in liquid nitrogen so pollen grains can be stored for a very long time so in fact for years right so you can store that pollen grains for a very long time for years right in liquid nitrogen so that will be at minus 196 uh, degrees celsius and this process what we call it cryo preservation right so the pollen grains who have less viability so that we can store them in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees celsius so which we call it cryo preservation of course this cryo preservation is already uh, been used to store uh, sperms right in case of uh, artificial insemination i hope uh, this artificial insemination which means the transfer of sperms into female reproductive tract right through or reproductive tract by other than natural method by other than natural method so we shall understand more about this artificial insemination in our coming classes so just i have mentioned what actually is this artificial insemination is just transfer of sperms into the female reproductive tract by other than uh, the natural methods so uh, this we are using in animal breeding uh, process, right? The, uh, the semen or the sperms of the animals, including human beings can also be, right? Can be stored for a very long time by using this method, the cryopreservation, right? So now the question comes that, what is the use of storing these pollen grains for a very long time? So using this cryopreservation method. So these pollen grains can be used in right crop breeding programs so this method will help very much in the crop breeding programs so here uh, we humans would like to develop variety of crops 
so that can produce large quantities of yield or better quality of the fruit or seed whatever uh, we are trying to improve the crops and increase the production of uh, food so for that purposes okay uh, uh, that all come under actually this crop breeding pro uh, programs and for that purpose we can store these pollen grains who have uh, uh, a lesser viability for a very long time using this cryopreservation uh, method right so i hope this is clear about the pollen viability and with this i will end uh, today's video we shall see in the next video about uh, the pistol thank you